All right, everyone, welcome to the November Ivy Talk. <clears throat> We're excited to be hosting this talk this evening. My name is Susie Farmer. I'm the Education Director at the Ivy Creek Foundation, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you tonight. I'd like to welcome David Koka. Uh, David is a district wildlife biologist with the department, the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources, and he's um, been in that position for the past 32 years. His current job responsibilities are the implementation of agency wildlife habitat and population programs over five counties in Northwestern Virginia. In this position, he spent a considerable amount of time on deer and black bear management issues. <clears throat> From 2014 to 2017, he also served as an adjunct professor at James Madison University teaching a wildlife management course. He holds degrees in wildlife management from West Virginia University and the University of Tennessee and has been certified as a wildlife biologist since 1992. He has over 35 technical and or popular publications to date, most recently publishing the book, Bear With Me, My Dear, Tales of a Virginia Wildlife Biologist. Um, and that was published in 2017. In 2021, he was invited to become a member of the IUCN North American Bear Expert Team, which was created in part to increase capacity of the bear specialist group and thereby increase bear conservation worldwide. And we are thankful to have him tonight and excited to hear his presentation. Um, before we begin, just a couple housekeeping items. Um, this is being recorded and it'll be posted to our website in the next few days. Um, please mute yourself if you have not done so. Um, and if you have questions, please put those in the chat box and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. And now I will turn it over to David. Good evening. Uh, I'm glad to be here and can you hear me okay? I hope. Good. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start with some very general information about kind of the agency a little bit and wildlife management to a certain degree. And then we'll get into some specifics about black bears and then eventually into the specific uh, details about mange and black bears. So um, first of all, I am a district wildlife biologist and there are basically 14 of me statewide. Um, <clears throat> we are in the wildlife division of our agency and in the map, yeah, basically these gray colored counties are the ones that I cover. So I cover Rockingham and then Albemarle Green, Madison and Rappahannock counties. I have worked a couple other districts sort of over the years just because of changes in personnel and such, but uh, some of the counties I've covered my whole career. This is my almost the end of my 33rd year here with the agency. I did work for two years before that for the state of Oklahoma <clears throat> before coming here. So um, there are 14 district biologists. Um, so anything kind of wildlife related in those counties where I cover are my responsibilities to a certain amount, but I do spend most of my time on kind of deer and black bear issues and also habitat management in conjunction with the US Forest Service. Um, we also have, I am not the bear biologist for the state of Virginia. We have species biologists that work statewide, but only on those particular species. If you're the bear biologist, you work statewide on bears. If you're the deer biologist, you work statewide on deer. We have a turkey and grouse biologist. We have small game biologists. We have a fur bear biologist, waterfowl biologists, um, and then one or two disease specialist people. Um, so that kind of gives you a very quick and dirty kind of um, overview of at least the wildlife division of our agency. I am not a law enforcement officer. I don't carry a gun in terms of don't have a badge and all that. Um, I'm strictly a biologist, uh, but I work 
a great deal with our law enforcement um, conservation police officers that work in our agency. Um, so that's my technical position with the agency. Um, then I wanted to go into just a little bit about, you know, the North American model of, of uh, wildlife management is that wildlife is owned by the public and it's held in trust for the public by basically public agencies, such as um, our state wildlife agency, uh, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, other agencies like that. Um, the stewards are us, but basically everybody in North America has access to wildlife in one way or another. This is contrary to the European model, where basically if you own the land, you own the wildlife. And I, I can tell you that there are uh, periodic um, threats or um, challenges, I guess, to that model um, because there's sometimes there's not a black and white when it comes to some issues relative to wildlife. So the privatization of wildlife is a um, concern, but it is an underpinning of the North American model that basically people don't own the wildlife species that are on their property. Basically the, the tenants under the North American model was that basically wildlife is in, is a public trust resource. Everybody has access to it. That at the same time was the elimination of markets for game, allocation of wildlife by law. Wildlife should only be killed for legitimate purposes. Wildlife are considered an international resource. Science is the proper tool for discharge of wildlife policy and democracy of hunting. Just mean that people, anybody can have access through certain processes to be able to uh, have access as a hunter, um, whether you're in Virginia or wherever. So that's kind of the underpinnings of the North American model. Another important issue for people to understand is basically the issue of who funds wildlife management in the U.S. And basically predominantly has been sportsmen um, through the license fees and what we call the Pittman-Robertson funds. Pittman-Robertson Act is the single most important piece of legislation, federal legislation that was passed in 1937. And basically it is a self-imposed excise tax, 11% excise tax that's built into the cost anytime that a firearm or basically firearms or ammunition is purchased in this country. So it's automatically built in there and that money gets distributed through a formula back to the states um, by a formula that includes how many licensed hunters they have in the state and how large the state is. So if you're a state like Alaska, you get a big chunk of that pie potentially. If you're a state like Delaware or Rhode Island, you get a smaller chunk of that pie. But there is a certain amount that's allocated to each state. Um, to date, basically in 2019, to give you an idea, $673 million in PR funds went back to the states. And since the inception of this legislation, 13 billion has been generated for wildlife management. Um, it does come back to the states through a 75-25 match. So let's say that um, a project is going to be considered by Virginia, and let's say it's a project for whatever, uh, black bears or deer or whatever, and the project looks like it's going to cost $100,000, then the state of Virginia would have to put up, our agency would have to come up with uh, $25,000 then the other $75,000 would come from the Pittman-Robertson funds. A very important thing to keep in mind is that it's very structured as to what you can use these funds for and what you can't use them for. But also it's kind of history um, that A. Willis Robertson, who was one of the two sponsors of the original bill, was a, a congressman from down in Lexington. Um, so there's a historical fact associated with Virginia that ties it directly to the Pittman-Robertson Fund. Um, and so that's how most wildlife management is funded across the country is through the use of these funds. And often the state match 
is through our license fees that we charge. <clears throat> so then we'll start to talk a little bit specifically about black bears and um, black bears are one of three species in particular, uh, species that are hunted in Virginia that we um, have management plans associated with. Uh, our white-tailed deer, black bears, and wild turkeys all have a management plan. Um, and basically you'll see on the here that the current management plan actually went out of date in 2021. These plans are always set up to run for roughly 10 years. We are actually in the process of revising the plan and it will probably get finalized and I would guess be acted on by our board of directors um, sometime in early to mid 2023. Um, what's involved in any of these plans are, um, these are stakeholder driven plans. These plans are not written basically by our agency. Um, we usually hire an outside entity to kind of oversee the writing of it and also the public input portion of it. And what we mean by they are stakeholder driven plans is that basically um, anybody who has an interest in this particular plan relative to black bears has a seat at the table. And so we typically have a statewide committee of stakeholders that bring in all these interests relative to black bears. And the interests, those stakeholders could be the various um, interests by hunting, hunters, the interests by our agricultural community, because bears do have the potential of creating, causing damage to agricultural crops, particular crops. Um, other interests would be uh, federal landowners in the state, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, U.S. Forest Service, the National Park Service, they all are represented as a stakeholder. Other stakeholders would be uh, animal welfare, uh, people who just like to uh, know that bears exist and exist at some level across the state of Virginia. Um, anyhow, anybody that has an interest relative to uh, black bears would have a representative on our statewide committee. So the statewide committee typically for these management plans involve about uh, probably somewhere between 15 and 25 people. Um, they meet a couple times during the planning process. They're, it's totally voluntary. Some of these people have served. This is our, we're in our third iteration of a black bear management plan. And some of these people have served each time in that capacity. The most they'll get out of it from us is maybe a free lunch when they come to a meeting to, to share and give us their values that represent their particular interests relative to black bears. Um, so what we do is when the plan is about to go out of date, we started in 2021 at some point, things kind of got a little behind due to COVID. But basically, usually it takes a year, year and a half to work through taking our current plan, identifying new issues that we hadn't thought about 10 years ago, such as mange and black bears um, and other things. And then other issues that are societal issues that may play a role in black bear management. And so they try to identify those things. And that's how we revise our, our previous plan is adding to it things that we hadn't thought about or weren't considered previously and then basically this document directs our agency in terms of our goals and objectives for black bears for a 10 year period. We can revise those objectives. It's built into the planning process because 10 years is a long period. You know, something could happen, you know, a nuclear disaster. So then how do you then manage black bears? Well, we didn't have that on our radar screen. So we do have it built in that we can make amendments to the black bear management plan. To do that, it would include input from uh, our staff, but then basically input from our stakeholders again to sign off and say, yeah, we understand why you're wanting to make these changes. And then that would be get their stamp of approval more or less. But anytime we do these plans, 
before it's finalized, it has to go through our board of directors. We do have a board of directors basically for the agency. It's, I believe, 11 people. They historically have represented each of the congressional districts in the state. Um, and I think they may have added an, a, a statewide one or something, but those people are on staggered terms. But basically, a plan, the plan revision will be presented to them at some point in time, like I said, probably early in 2023 or so or in the spring. And then they can basically uh, review it and add or make any suggested changes to the plan. But basically, eventually, they authorize the approval of that plan for the agency. So that's how these planning processes take place. And so just to give you an idea of, you know, it's not a bunch of biologists sitting in a room to figure out what we plan to do relative to bears. It is driven by the public across the state of Virginia. Um, and these are important, especially these, the black bear, I can speak specifically about the black bear and deer management plans. They do help the agency become somewhat insulated at times from political driven uh, entities that want to see some major changes relative to the way we do deer or black bear management. Or they can help us if uh, a member of the legislature has an idea about something. If it kind of runs a little bit wonky to our management plan, we can sit down with that individual and explain this is the planning process. Our stakeholders have, have directed us to do this. It would be contrary to what you might be suggesting as a possible change through uh, the General Assembly. And often that, that gets their attention because they understand all these stakeholders have had some input into it across the state. <clears throat> so that's our current plan. Like I said, we're, we're currently revising it. We do have, I am on a technical committee that, that puts in technical aspects to the management plan but the, the stakeholders specifically really try to get at values associated with black bears for the residents of uh, the Commonwealth. So when I talk about bears, it's easy to talk about bears at times because people are very interested in black bears. You know, we only have black bears in Virginia. Hopefully everybody here understands that. We don't have grizzlies. They were never in this part of the country. Uh, they were basically out west um, and up in the Rockies and in Canada and Alaska. Um, black bears are one of several species of bears worldwide. They're the most uh, widely distributed bear species in the world um, and probably one of the most adaptable um, in a lot of situations. But everybody likes, you know, cute, cuddly cubs. Um, they in, they create a lot of interest by the public. Uh, we probably get daily interest in some form or fashion by a member of the public relative to some aspect of black bears um, to our agency. So I um, always had to throw in some humorous cartoons at times. Um, you know, there are lots of different um, viewpoints relative to the, the people have, the, the residents of the Commonwealth relative to bears. There are people who um, think that bears are great. There are other people in the Commonwealth that think black bears are very dangerous and every bear out there is trying to uh, injure them or kill them. And reality is often somewhere in between those two viewpoints is what I found in my career working for the agency. So uh, back in the 1980s, the green areas that you see in the map depict basically the, the range at that point in time of black bears in Virginia. And it corresponded at a time where we had 3.2 million people in the state in the 1980s. Um, so typically they were associated with the Blue Ridge Mountains and the Alleghenies. Um, and also down in the southeast in the Great Dismal Swamp. Um, those populations had been there for many years. You know, the bear populations were statewide um, at colonial times when the people first settled Virginia. 
but basically between um, uh, uncontrolled harvest and changes that were implemented by clearing large areas of uh, the forest to create open uh, homesteads and things, we reduced the habitat for bears across the state. And so at the turn of the, you know, uh, 19th to the 20th centuries, um, there were very few bears in Virginia and basically where they were in much of these same pockets in the mountains, mountainous areas and in the swamp. And basically these populations kind of went on like this um, even after our agency was created, which was in 1916, um, populations of bears languished for a period of time. But basically by the year 2000, you can see that bears had recovered quite well across the Commonwealth. And most of the state is considered occupied range of bears. You can see there's some occasional sightings in the Northern Neck area and over on the Eastern shore. And a lot of that is more of a function of Maryland than it is um, Virginia. But that's a pretty dramatic change in 20 plus years. And at the same time, we've had a basically more than doubling of the human population. And so as I indicated early on, bears are, black bears are very adaptable to people, a lot more adaptable than we used to give them credit for. Um, when I first came to work for the agency, um, working with the US Forest Service um, on management issues, uh, we always thought that you had to have very large tracts of land, uh, minimal disturbance, to manage for black bears. And basically we found that black bears are really um, can adapt to us. Um, and hence it causes often the issues that we have at times with bears and these human bear conflicts. Um, <clears throat> our statewide black bear harvest, um, it basically in essence, um, a good indication of our black bear population. Um, it's a reflection of it. It's not the exact same numbers. We, we throw out numbers crudely that Virginia probably currently has somewhere between 15 and maybe 20,000 black bears on the landscape. Um, but basically our population estimates have corresponded very closely and statistically with our bear harvest over time. And we increased our harvest of bears in the past um, 15 to 20 years to try to curb some of that population growth. You can't have more and more bears on the landscape and more and more people, i.e. over 8 million people in the state without having more and more conflicts between those two species. So, um, and as these were direct uh, results of input through our management plans that people wanted us to start to stabilize and even more recently start to reduce bear numbers in portions of the state. So we get a lot of phone calls about black bears and bears in these human bear conflict issues. Um, and often uh, the number one kind of call out there will be associated with bears somehow getting involved with um, human trash. Um, you know, any type of food, human food item is of interest to bears when it comes to feeding. They like free foods. Um, and so this is our number one issue when it comes to bears and people is a bear getting into trash, not necessarily in these type of landfill type of situations, but just residential trash is a big issue across the Commonwealth. This is another um, human bear issue. This is uh, an example of uh, black bear damage uh, to a cornfield. Um, this was a uh, cornfield in the Shenandoah Valley, and it uh, was, I think, between maybe 12 and 15 acres. And you can see that basically where there's supposed to be corn, there's not corn. Uh, bears will 
Um, they have a tremendous sense of smell and they will wait until um, corn gets into what, the milk stage. Prior to that, they'll walk by these cornfields, but they know when that, then the corn just matures enough that it gets into the milk stage. And then these bears will move in there and they will basically come into a cornfield. They'll sit down on a spot. They'll grab a stalk of corn. They'll take a bite or two out of your corn and lay that stalk down. And then they'll grab another one. And so they make what we refer to as these rooms. They're circles. You know, you call them crop circles if you wanted to, but they're not done by aliens. They're done by bears. And so they'll make a circle where they've sat there, pulled as much of that corn to them and eaten it. And then they might move over a few rows or they might move partway across the field, but then they'll sit back down again and feed again and create another room. And so, you know, some years, some fields might get very little damage, but if you're the guy that owns this cornfield, you just suffered pretty significant damage. Now, is it significant on a county scale? No. Is it significant on a statewide scale? No but it is to the individual that has this corn crop. And so that is a type of agricultural damage that some growers experience and they experience it every year from bears. To give you an idea how um, barriers can break down between bears, bears are typically solitary. If you see more than one bear together, typically it's going to be a female with some offspring. Males do not hang out with them. Uh, they actually can be a detriment to females and cubs because oftentimes they'll want to, um, and we've documented this, other states have documented it. Basically, they might try to kill cubs, both to eat them, but also to cause females to come into estrus earlier so that they can breed with them. Um, and so females that have young offspring with them We'll typically keep a low profile around male bears. Um, but basically, back when we used to have open dumps, I think in this picture, you can count up to 15 different bears that are feeding in here. Again, they like free foods. Now they may set up kind of a pecking order in here in terms of some big male might rule the roost, but and the other ones might feed around the outskirts from them. But these are artificial type feeding situations that bears can take advantage of. <clears throat> and so we deal with issues sort of like this. Um, this was what took place in Yellowstone National Park in the early 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s, up until the Craigheads did their research there when they started closing down dumps because, and basically it was entertainment. People would come out and they would have seats out here to watch the bears feeding in these artificial dumps. Um, this is another type of human bear interaction. Um, this is what it looks like if a bear enters a occupied dwelling. This is actually a trailer. You can see where a board has been put in the uh, part of the door. Uh, a bear came in here on numerous occasions over several nights um, and basically uh, fairly significant damage to the kitchen. It, eventually tore up the, the cabinets, um, opened up the refrigerator, destroyed food that was in the refrigerator and freezer, um, got in the trash, whatever was available. Um, this is not a very frequent thing, but it does occur. We do, if I had to throw out a number, maybe across the state, there might be five to 10 to 15 instances, maybe in a given year, of a bear that enters or tries to enter the occupied dwelling, occupied portion of a dwelling. This is, you know, this is unacceptable from our agency for a, a typical black bear. Um, now, this is not a bear coming into your screen porch and getting your bird feeder, bird food. That is not um, cause for major alarm. That means you need to store your bird food better. Um, a bear that walks into an garage because the door is open and gets into a freezer is not coming into the occupied dwelling. I've had bears go through windows, doors, um, crawl through doggy doors, 
these types of things coming into the occupied portion of a home. That's what we would consider unacceptable. In those situations, we would try to put our hands on that bear and remove it. We would not move it. We would euthanize it. That is not a typical behavior for a bear and one that would be tolerated by our agency. <clears throat> now, we can do lots of things to manage trash and these attractants so that bears can't get in them. But sometimes it comes down to just some lubricant. Um, this is an example. Bears are incredibly inquisitive and very intelligent. They're second only to primates in intelligence. Um, and so they remember things and that's what often can get them in trouble with humans. But basically this is a quote unquote bear resistant trash can and the bear has gotten into it. How? Well, basically over time, these trash facilities often uh, the latches get to where they're, you know, they're sitting out in the weather, all kinds of weather. They get rusty. They stop working. The door has been slammed so many times. Maybe it's gotten slightly bent. Something causes the mechanism not to work the way it's supposed to. And hence, it's not latching. And the bear comes and tests it. And hence, he gets a reward. So we can put a lot of these types of pieces of equipment into operation but it also takes people to keep them maintained so that they're not a problem down the road in terms of the management of those bears and not, accept, not giving them access to uh, potential human foods. This picture I just had to include, this is, again, shows how creative, inquisitive, and intelligent bears can be. The, Second most popular thing behind is trash for bears as a food item, human food item, is bird seed, bird feeders. And this is an example. This is actually taken by one of our fisheries biologists. His wife called him to the window one Sunday morning and said, Steve, can you look at this? And basically this bear had crawled up into the bird feeder and was crawled up in there and had been eating bird seed. Um, Birdseed has a lot of calories associated with it. So bears have figured that out a long time ago. They can get a lot of calories eating birdseed. And as a result, they often will come around bird feeders and they will break bird feeders, they'll bend poles, all this sort. So there are places across the Commonwealth where um, you, as a person who likes to feed birds, may not be able to feed birds for many months out of the year. We tell people, you know, if you're having a problem with a bird feeder, then you need to take it down, put it inside, leave it alone, and maybe put it out in the winter months, maybe, maybe starting in November until maybe mid to late winter. But when the bears start to move again, you probably ought to put it back inside. Now, one common misconception about bears and bird feeders is, oh, well, I'll put the bird feed out feeder out during the day and I'll put it in at night because that's when typically the bears come around there and destroy your feeder or get into the bird food. That does not work. Um, the problem with that is, first of all, birds are not clean feeders. Half the feed that's out there will drop down on the ground and the bear will still have access to it. But more importantly, that smell is there. These guys have tremendous sense of smell. You know, I've heard all kinds of figures, but a lot more stronger than bloodhounds and all these other hounds and all these other animals. So they can smell that remnant. And so they will come out there and keep coming out there looking for that free bird seed. And if there's any kind of reward there, he's gonna keep coming back because of that tremendous memory that bears have. So putting it out during the day, putting it in at night is a recipe for disaster. We tell people, no, just put them in, stop feeding birds for a while. The bird, we do it because we like to see the birds. They're not dependent on us for food. Uh, as I mentioned trash being an issue. Um, BFI does not stand for bear food inside. It basically is Browning Ferris, the dumpster company. But basically bears can figure out quite easily how to get into dumpsters. This was an example. This was a school property I was called to 20 years ago plus. Um, 
the dumpsters they had had plastic doors on the sides, um, like this door, instead of being metal, was plastic. And they also had plastic lids on the top. And a lot of times those, those things are put in place both for weight, to reduce the weight, but also they're quiet. The banging of a plastic lid is nothing compared to the banging of a metal lid when it shuts. The problem is that plastic can be um, easily outfoxed by a black bear. Uh, they will climb up on top of the dumpsters at plastic lids and just sit on the plastic lids and push their way into the trash. They'll pop these plastic doors out and crawl in there and eat trash at will. Um, and so basically it's a simple fix. We tell the whoever is renting these or owns the dumpsters that basically they'll need to get metal doors and metal lids fabricated to keep the bears out. Um, and sometimes it may also involve, you know, a safety chain or something so that when the door is shut, you can latch it because some bears will figure out how to just slide doors. But you can do all these practices, but if the people don't close the doors, you've just wasted a bunch of time and money. Um, so it's an easy fix, but oftentimes it still takes that, that human uh, initiative to make sure that, that the bears cannot get access to trash over time. Another simple fix for some entities, uh, we've used electric fencing a lot for bears. Uh, bears do not like electric fences. They don't like getting shocked. Um, these are standard uh, electric um, pulsing devices, just like you use for keeping cattle in and sheep in and things like that. Um, but basically, they have to be built in a certain way so that bears won't either try to go under the fence, like under the bottom wire, or that they're high enough so the bear can't just walk over top of it. There has to be enough strands so that the bear can't just walk in between the different uh, strands of the fence. Uh, bears don't fly, they're gonna try to climb something or they will try to crawl under it. And so that's why we tell people when they build a, a fence to keep bears out of hives or out of trash, that the lowest strand of electricity can't be any more than about six inches off the ground or the bear will cr crawl under it. Um, bears do not have a collarbone, so they can get their head in something, they can get their body in there. Again, they're very creative. So in addition to these uh, human bear conflicts, we also had a conflict for a long time until about the late, early 1990s, uh, mid 1990s. But basically people at times would purposely try to feed bears just so they could see them. Um, and so we had to create a regulation that made it illegal for people to purposely or indirectly feed bears. And indirect feeding can include the bird seed, the trash, the trash can, things like that. Um, and it's not like we have our conservation officers are not out there, you know, driving around looking for trash cans that bears have gotten into and then trying to cite somebody. But we can use the the power of law to change people's behaviors towards making these foods available to bears. Um, but anyhow, it is a issue, has been an issue, <coughs> excuse me, in parts of Virginia, but also in other states where people purposely want to feed bears because they want to see them. Um, and it, but it, it creates a bigger issue in terms of even towards the North American model of privatizing those bears. Well, these are my bears coming into my yard that I get to watch. That is not normal behavior for the bears and should not be normal behavior for the residents of the Commonwealth. Now, we're going to get into changing bears and I will, um, I've got several pictures in here. Um, I can tell you the first bear that we caught with in modern times with mange in Virginia was in 2004. We captured it. Uh, a person had a camera out. Um, site that was he was actually feeding deer, which was legal, and a bear started coming to it, and he noticed that um, the bear 
was lacking a lot of hair, was in, has crusty skin, things like this. So they contacted us. We saw the pictures. We figured out, yep, this is probably most likely a case of mange. We actually captured the bear. Um, we took the bear and held it in conjunction with the uh, Wildlife Center of Virginia, where we had some bear holding facilities. And over the course of, I want to say weeks, probably months, we treated the bear to eliminate the mites that cause the mange. And basically, eventually, the bear uh, grew a new coat of hair, was clean of mites, we would periodically scrape it to see if it had any mites remaining. And once it was clean of mites, uh, we turned that bear loose back where it came from. In hindsight, that may not have been the best course of action, but, um, but it was the first time we had dealt with a, a bear with mange. I'll give you a few facts and figures about, this is sarcoptic mange we're referring to. Um, it is caused by a mite that burrows into the skin and can only be seen with a microscope. So if you think you've, you know, that you see a mite on you, you're seeing something else. They're microscopic. Historically, they're seen in red foxes and coyotes. Um, but most mammals, including pets and people, are susceptible. Um, I've, I've read through the literature. There's just about, I don't know, hardly any mammals that have not been documented to be susceptible to sarcoptic mange. Now, it doesn't mean that great numbers of them uh, will get these infestations, but um, if they're exposed to it, they often can pick it up. So all these mammals, including us, are susceptible to these mites. Uh, clinical signs may include intense itching, hair loss, thickened skin, and altered behavior. And I'll talk about the altered behavior in a little bit. Um, but basically, these bears will lose hair, portions of hair. They'll often have crusty skin, uh, thickened skin. And as I mentioned earlier, bears are relatively solitary. Um, they can congregate due to trash and bird feeders or other sources should be minimized to reduce the spread. Um, again, the mites moving from one bear to another can be exacerbated by these artificial food sources, if you want to call them that. So oftentimes people that will call us and tell us about a mangy bear will say, yeah, it's been getting in my trash or it's been, you know, getting the bird feeder. And we're like, please put those things, secure them so the bear can get to them. Because it's not just that bear. There's other bears that basically could come in there and then pick up the mites that are left behind by that infested bear. So this is just another example. Um, you know, he's this one is missing hair on his face and lower legs um, and a part of the side. But it still has hair on its back and things like that. We have started to evaluate these bears a little bit more in intensively, not just relying strictly on how much hair loss, but what the musculature of the bear looks like, how they're moving, and just if they seem like they still have full musculature or they look like they're skin and bones uh, walking around. Um, so since 2014, and actually since 2018, we've seen a tremendous increase in the number of cases in the counties where mange has been documented. It's currently roughly in about a 12 county area. Originally, uh, the first cases outside that first single bear that we caught um, in Eastern, that was that blue dot, I'm cursor here, but this blue dot here was the first bear that we caught with that first case in 2004. And we never saw any more mange bears until about 2014 and they started showing up in basically Western Frederick and Northern, Northwestern Shenandoah counties. And it seemed to be kind of languishing there for some period of years, but then really starting in about 2018 or so, we started seeing this um, movement, uh, seeing it across more of a landscape. And um, 
we consider our county to be positive for sarcoptic mange in bears. If we have, I think it's three cases in one particular year or um, maybe five cases over two years or something like that, we have a standard that we use. And so any of these counties that you see that are hatched uh, in this map are considered to be mange positive counties. Um, and I can tell you that, you know, Nelson County has already jumped into that since this uh, map was put together in 2020. Uh, and I believe Rockbridge is also mange positive county now. So, so we have a few more counties. Um, what is causing the spread of it in this, you know, in, increase in counties, we can't really answer that at this point in time. We are taking steps to try to answer some of these questions. To give you a little bit bigger picture, um, you will notice that this is uh, West Virginia and Virginia, the state line here between the two states. But basically this is part of a bigger um, issue relative to sarcoptic mange in bears. Sarcoptic mange has been in the bears in Pennsylvania for roughly 20 years. Um, since then, we have then seen um, it come into Maryland, West Virginia, and Virginia. Now, I don't think that ours specifically came from Pennsylvania, but all these states are sharing it. And there are other states in the country that are having similar type issues in terms of uh, sarcoptic mange in black bears. We hope the meeting back in the spring, the first time the meeting has been focused on sarcoptic mange in bears, and we hosted it with roughly about 20 or 25 states uh, represented either in person or virtually. Uh, I know that Oklahoma, Arkansas, um, and several other states have also had pretty significant issues with mange in bears. So a popular question from the public is, why does the Department of Wildlife not treating mange infested bears? Well, first of all, you know, that, that initial bear that we treated and released, we did not put radio collar on that bear or anything when we released it. So we do not know the fate of that bear over we did over the course of two or three years, um, we treated somewhere around eight or nine different bears, again, in conjunction with the Wildlife Center of Virginia. We used two different, uh, that was a standard uh, protocol technique, whatever has been the use of ivermectin over time to clean, to get rid of the mites infestation in, in bears and other wildlife. Um, so we used ivermectin on many of those bears. Then there's a newer form, I think it's called Bivecta, that is less um, intensive. So it takes a little bit less period of time to get the bears clean of the mites. So we used that on one or two bears, one of the last couple bears that we did. But anyhow, we treated several of these bears. We released them. They all had ear tags. Several of them had radio collars. And Roughly about half of those bears we found in 12 to 18 months with significant infestations of mange again. This picture that you're seeing here was one of those individuals. It was a male that um, I captured it in Rappahannock County. It had a fairly significant case of mange. We treated it. We eventually, it was, and these are animals clean of mites when we release them. Uh, so it was released. It had ear tags, radio collar on, actually the radio collar at some point in time failed. So we had no radio contact with it. But this is a picture, one of two that was sent to me by a resident in Rappahannock County because this bear started visiting their property where, of course, they had a bird feeder out. They did take it in. But basically, we saw that he had another case, significant case of mange down the road from when he had been treated. So as an agency, as the wildlife division, um, in conjunction with our wildlife veterinarian at the time, Dr. Megan Kirkchester, 
we made a decision as an agency that we are not treating any more bears with these types of products to try to clean them up from mange because long-term it's not having the impact that we would hope for by our data. And is it really ethical, uh, an ethical practice to be doing this to these bears? We're just basically delaying the inevitable for this bear. Um, this bear was eventually uh, captured by me again and euthanized because of the condition he had. Um, one other question that people often ask about this treating versus not treating, we know there are probably people out there that are lacing uh, whatever, donuts or whatevers with ivermectin and throwing them out, hoping that they're treating bears in the area. The problem is, first of all, you don't know that um, bears are getting it that have mange. And so a bear that doesn't have mange and gets the ivermectin, it might uh, mess up his system in the future to be able to fight off the mites. But more importantly, ivermectin can be fatal to a variety of wildlife species, um, either in the doses that would be used or just in general. You can't just put some of these products out on the landscape. It's like putting a poison out there and expecting only the the rat out there in my yard is going to eat it. No, the other things are going to eat it and basically succumb to it. So there's ethical issues uh, associated with that. And so if we ever hear of that, we uh, gently but firmly try to inform people that what they're doing is not good for the bears, but also potentially fatal to other wildlife species in Virginia. So that's my kind of quick and dirty um, synopsis of bears, bears management to a certain extent, but specifically about uh, sarcoptic Indian bears. There's a lot that I can tell you when we hosted that interstate meeting, there is a lot of information that all of us as state wildlife agencies do not understand about this current, uh, current being the last 10 to 15 years, uh, infestation of sarcoptic mange in black bears. Um, Pennsylvania has done an intensive research project. They're currently in the throes of trying to analyze and publish those results. Some of the results that initially we've heard from them seem to be a bit contrary to what we've seen in Virginia. So, so we just kind of take that a little bit of a grain of salt. Um, but um, so there's a, there's a lot of issues associated with this whole dynamic that um, we cannot answer currently. We are um, trying to put some radio collars out on bears that are uh, marginally uh, infested by, with mange. We don't want them to be skin and bone bears. Um, but if they have a certain, again, musculature, or seem like they're healthy, um, we're trying to put some radio collars on those bears and, and follow those bears over time to get a better idea of, you know, are some of these bears exposed and then surviving some of these infestations? I, we have to think that some of them probably do, but we don't have hard data on that. Um, are they just succumbing to it? More likely, there are some that do that. I, I have experience with that. Um, I mentioned a few slides ago the this idea that that some of these bears kind of change their behavior, become less um, cautious or interested or concerned about people structure. That is uh, something we have. Um, as an agency and other agencies have observed. And some of these bears get in these, I think they're severe um, infestations. They will often, I mean, we've got probably 50 to 100 examples of them uh, over the course of time where these bears will, they'll crawl into a, 
under somebody's deck and leave, live there for a couple of days. They'll crawl into a garage. They'll crawl into a, a doghouse. Uh, they'll crawl into a shed. Um, and they basically will live there. I had one that crawled into a, a, a tractor trailer that was um, where they had stored straw to be sold to the public. And a bear basically went in there and basically made a bed and just stayed there for a period of time. Um, so I think, and again, this is just my opinion and the opinion of several other biologists that I've spoken to, but I think they're just so unhappy with life. They feel so bad. They're so itchy that, and their systems are so out of whack that they just don't really care. They're just going to climb in something and try to feel comfortable. Um, we had one six months, a year ago that crawled into a foundation of a house that was being built and just hung out there. Um, so they'll do this. And again, it's with no regard for people. I had, I mean, I had some other slides I could have thrown in here, but you know, one is a, a bear that's just sitting on somebody's front porch as a case of mange. And it's just kind of sitting there like, you know, it's pathetic. And it's, you know, if it, if it could talk, it might say, could you help me or something? But um, they just kind of lose their mind. A, a, an example, another example I can tell you is I had one that uh, came to a, an orchard on pick your own peach day kind of deal. It was probably a hundred people in that orchard. And I see the video of it. It wasn't there when I showed up, but basically the bear just is walking through there. It has no interest in people, nothing. It's just unhappy with life and it's walking around and it's missing a bunch of hair. Um, so there's that element that takes place. Um, and so we've had to remove some of these bears from under these uh, structures, in these structures, under these decks and things like that, because um, not only is that bear there, but also those mites are there and potentially uh, the residents of those dwellings may come in contact with them. So that's um, what we see about some of those behavior changes that we've we've been able to see with some of the bears in Virginia. And I know it, our partners in West Virginia and Maryland have seen similar things um, in their states. So with that, um, I did, yeah, I guess the last slide was, yeah, I did write a book. Anybody's <coughs> had a position like mine uh, could write a book. Everybody I work with could have written a book. I just decided to do it a few years ago. Um, you can find it on Amazon, um, but it's just a bunch of stories about dealing with deer issues and bear issues. Um, and I've had interesting ones and some not so interesting over the years. And so, yes, I did put that in print. So with that, I guess I need to try to stop the share. And then uh, looks like we have... Not sure where the chats and see what kind of questions we have. Yeah, I can get it for you. Okay. Um, before I read those, I just had one, one question. Um, does this mainly affect adult bears or does it also affect cubs? And is it gender specific or do both genders get? Uh, um, we've seen no differences between genders and actually um, I I can't say that we have seen it per se in a, a very dependent cub, but, um, you know, I'll go back to the biology bears breed every other year. Cubs will stay with a female for a year and a half till she gets ready to come into estrus again. I do know that when those cubs yearlings, um, go off on their own and they're kind of like a bunch of teenagers roaming around trying to find some place to call home, we do see those age classes all the way through to older bears that have infestations of mange. So now if it occurs like in a den situation where a female is there and if she has mange, I would have to think that it's likely that she's going to pass those mites on to those cubs. And so maybe some of those cubs may not even make it out of a den situation. That's a, 
that's an unknown uh, on our part, but it's it's quite possible because they're in close quarters there. You know, most den situations are a pretty tight little spot that a female decides to crawl into. Um, but yes, we documented all types of ages from year and a half old to uh, up to senescence almost, um, and both males and females. We have had not as many, but probably I can, I'd throw my, a number out there. I've probably come in contact with maybe five or 10 where somebody's contacted me about a bear with mange. And when I've gone to investigate, um, we have, myself or the fellow that works for me, have found the bear um, and it's dead on uh, one that I can tell you for sure was a, it was an adult female, very poor condition, and it had curled up literally in the window well of a person's house, and that's where I found the, the corpse. So it does kill some of these bears over time. Which ones and how frequently that, exit, that happens, we don't have a very good uh, mechanism for evaluating that at this point in time, but hopefully we're hoping some of this uh, future radio call work can, can try to give us some of those answers. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so far there are three questions. I'm gonna start with the second question and come back to the first one. Um, do you have an idea of how prevalent mange is or uh, percent of bears infected? And do they have the same varieties uh, that fox or other canines have, or do you do they have their own species? Well, there is a bear specific mange for optics, and we have a um, one of our other district biologists actually got her master's degree through the University of Georgia studying mange in black bears in Pennsylvania. So she's she knows it a lot better than I do <laughs> for sure. Um, but, and so historically, you know, we knew a few bears might get a little spot of mange and we always kind of generalized that it was, and we had tested some of them, but that it was the bear specific form. Um, uh, but sarcoptic, basically it's the same mite that you would have if you were a coyote or a fox or this black bear. It's the same mite. They're, they're totally different mites. And so she, she looked at that um, in her Pennsylvania work. Um, prevalence rates, we have not any good data on. You know, our best at this point, it's just this shotgun of, we know these counties are considered to be positive for mange and bears. And we get, you know, a lot of our calls in my counties these days are more and more towards the um, people calling about bears with mange versus the classic bears in my bird feeder getting my trash kind of stuff. So we also can track those calls as in kind of an index. We also are gathering data from um, entities where um, bears are killed, not just by hunters, by other entities in the state and in some of these crop type situations. And if what percentage of their bears that they've ended up killing, we're also showing signs of having mange. So we are trying to glean some of that information, but we're, we don't have any, I can't give you any definitive numbers or percentages or anything like that in terms of uh, the prevalence of it. Um, there are some pockets in some counties. Um, there was a pocket in extreme western Rockingham County. There was also a pocket in eastern Rockingham County where uh, it just seemed like that whole community, just about every bear that we were getting a call about um, had pretty significant mange. So I, I, th I think what we're seeing in some of the data over time is as it has spread, it's kind of worked its way through, and this is, again, my opinion, um, but it's 
it's work through some of those bear populations. It's going to be hard on them initially. Some of those bears are not going to persist from it. Um, but then maybe over time, maybe some of the, the, the bears that have been exposed, maybe they build up some resistance, maybe. That's a, a question for a, a research project. But um, so I think there's kind of a wave. It's kind of like when you get um, gypsy moth in an area and they come through and they defoliate the trees and certain trees that are already stressed are going to die from that. But some trees are not necessarily going to die from that initial big wave of it. And then after that, the, the infestations are typically a little bit lower. So anyhow, again, there's lots of unknowns that we have relative to, to this whole aspect of mange. But um, so that's the best I can kind of answer that one, I guess. Um, to, to follow that up, do you, um, do you assume that this is happening because the numbers are too concentrated? Well, we did, ha we did have very, in these areas, um, we had very high numbers of bears, densities. And so, and I can tell you there's, we're trying to tease out data right now because we've seen a drop in bear numbers in some of these the same areas where the infestation is. But it, the question is how much of it, it might be associated with mange versus how much might be associated with our change in regulations where we were trying to reduce bear numbers through hunting. So we're still trying to work through some of that data because it's, it's gonna be several years worth of data that we'll have to look at. Um, you can't just pick one point in time and say, oh, this is what's happened kind of thing. So there's probably, possibly some impacts locally in some bears in terms of, you know, some of these mortalities. But I know that Pennsylvania, who's had it the longest, they have not seen population level impacts from mange and bears there. But things are a little bit different in Pennsylvania than they are in Pennsylvania than Virginia. So anyhow, there's a lot we still need to learn. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, two more questions. I'm gonna go to the one that relates to bears and then the next one that, re that relates to your, uh, to your job because I wanna make sure we get that one answered. Uh, what's the protocol for tagging bears and does the color of the tag mean something? Yes. Um, first of all, any animal that we use drugs on, and this was a, some federal legislation a few years ago, but basically, any bear, any animal, whether it's a deer or a bear or a wombat or whatever, if we handle it, use drugs on it, we have to identify it with an ear tag so that people can know uh, it has to deal primarily with withdrawal dates of drugs and their potential for people to consume animals that have had drugs in them recently when there's a, a hunting season in effect. Um, so anytime we handle a bear, specifically, it will get an ear tag. It will get two ear tags, basically, just the, in the event that they might lose one of their ear tags. Um, every region of the state basically uses, um, they have different numbering systems, um, and they may be different colors. That part I'm not sure about because I'm not the keeper of the, of the ear tags. But I can tell you in this part of the state from in region four, which is from more or less interstate 64 north all the way over to interstate 95, um, all the bears that would get an ear tag in it would be a red ear tag from us and it would have a number specific to that bear. So it might be bear number 421. Um, another bear released might be bear number 435 or whatever, but it will be a red ear tag. Um, historically, we used to do use different ear tag colors, but basically we've kind of standardized that in recent years. Um, we do have bears that, uh, that we, for one reason or another, end up in the spring of the year, we may end up with a I hate to use the word orphan cub, but a cub 
And if it ends up at the Wildlife Center of Virginia, um, they hold them for a certain period of time. We release those barrels. We release them on our state-owned lands. They will have your tags with them again, but their ear tags will be, I believe they're, they use a green ear tag. It's a very similar type tag, a button tag, but it's a green ear tag and would have a specific number that, that they keep track of and that we have records for. Um, but in this part of the world, most bears that you're gonna see are gonna be having, a, if it's been handled at all, it's gonna have a red ear tag. Um, now, Shenandoah National Park, you know, the Park Service, bears and wildlife on the Shenandoah National Park is basically um, under the ownership of the federal government. It's the best way I can tell you that. We have no jurisdiction over the bears on Shenandoah National Park with a deer or whatever. And so if they handle a bear, they have protocols in terms of they will ear tag it too. And I'm not sure what kind of color. I think they use three different types of colors. They use a color for the north region of the park, work for the, a different color for the central part, and then another one for the southern district of the park. That just helps them in terms of if they're moving a bear around from north to south or whatever, so they know where it originated from. But, um, and I don't know what, what colors they use. Um, and I can tell you that historically, they have not handled very many bears um, to the point where they're drugging them and marking them. Um, so it's not generally been an issue where we get a phone call saying, what's this bear number, 555, whatever. Um, I mean, I've dealt with maybe two in my career that have come off Shenandoah National Park. So um, that's not been a, a big deal. But all ours in this part of the world from our agency would be red. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a high school student that's joining us this evening and they are interested in wildlife bi biology as a career. Uh, what education track would you suggest for them to have the best opportunity to succeed in wildlife biology? And they also were wondering what a typical day as a district wildlife biologist is like. Uh, a lot of times there is no typical day, but... Um... In terms of career track uh, training, um, most states have a land grant university that offer historically a wildlife and or wildlife and fisheries uh, degree programs. Virginia Tech has a very long history and I work with lots of Virginia Tech graduates, um, either as with got their bachelor's or master's degrees there. Um, but there are other schools that in Virginia who offer maybe a biology program with a wildlife emphasis. Um, I've had interns, I've had probably 15 or 20 interns over the year from Bridgewater College because they offer a, a wildlife emphasis. Um, and um, so they've gone and done internships with us, some of our staff. Uh, so they have a program. Um, you know, William & Mary has a program because they're, they have a primary focus on um, raptors. Um, so there's several different entities across the state in Virginia that, that offer um, even, I think there's programs at George Mason University. Um, anyhow, so. There's a couple of different schools in Virginia where you can get either a historically wildlife program or something that's more, it might be wildlife or it might be conservation biology. Um, and I would just, if I was going to look at a school, I would look at the specifics of the program. Cause I mean, I started off where I was gonna be at a community college. I went to the community college and then I was supposed to transfer it to um, a school with Maryland Frostburg and their program was way too, way too econ academic for me. They wanted me to take a lot of calculus and other things. And I was like, no, this is not one. So I ended up going to that community college with a wildlife emphasis. Then I transferred to West Virginia University, got my bachelor's degree there, 
had some overlap in terms of some courses I had to take again because it was at the university level. Um, and but I will say that most of our most of our biological staff, uh, whether district biologists or species specialists, most of us have uh, master's degrees. There's a couple that have bachelor's degrees only, but most of us have wallet have master's degrees. We have a couple of staff members that have PhDs. That's a little heavy at times for state agencies, but our, our waterfowl biologist, a guy who was our waterfowl biologist for a long time, is oversees all our waterfowl wetland programs. Um, got his PhD at Cornell University studying black ducks. Um, so some people just decide they want to work for a state agency. They don't want to go into academia. So that's always an, an option. Um, so anyhow, um, lots of schools are available and other schools in other states. Um, there are some schools that historically are very strong in terms of wildlife programs. And I'm a little biased. I think the University of Tennessee did a pretty good job, but University of Georgia is a very strong school. Historically, University of Maine has been a strong school. I mean, anyhow. Um, but, and once you get past the, the bachelor's program, you start focusing into a, like a master's. Then it's more, what do you want to spend two or three years of your life studying and finding out the people that are kind of the heavy hitters in that, in that working with that particular species or group of species. Um, and that's how most people end up in graduate school and finding a project that seems interesting to them because they're going to be living and breathing it for a period of time. Uh, quick and dirty average day. I mean, I'm like everybody else. I sit on a computer and do a lot more on a computer and on the phone and everything else than, um, than I would have thought I would be doing, but um, that's just the world we live in. But I can, I do have a certain amount of flexibility. If I just decide I'm not going to sit in the office today, I can, I can go find plenty of things to do. Um, and so in that respect, my, my position has been fairly flexible and I've had lots of enjoyable experiences as I've written in my book and other stuff and met lots of interesting people along the way. Um, so anyhow, it's been a good career. Um, and there's lots of, I'm working with a lot of younger people now, so I'm the, one of the old guys in the room now. So, um, so anyhow, and it's, there's more, there has been more turnover in recent years. There's a lot of people that are getting ready to retire and that kind of stuff. So there's always, there's always some job openings, but they're always historically they've always been fairly competitive um, in when they're filling positions. So um, master's degree certainly helps over just having a bachelor's degree. Hope that answers it. I would just add that um, you know volunteering before you go into those programs to see what kind of get an idea would. Yeah, um, we. As an agency, I know we don't make use of any volunteers that are like under 18, you know, it has to all do with minors and stuff. Um, I can tell you that, you know, this, <clears throat> just an example, this Saturday is when we're doing a lot of sampling for chronic wasting disease in deer. We make use of a lot of volunteers, predominantly through universities. We have some Virginia Tech people, some people from Bridgewater College, some people from George Mason University, I think that's the three that come to my mind that will be working with our staff at these check stations to sample deer. And um, so that's an option. Um, once a person is at least 18, they can try to volunteer at least this time of year. It's, it's sampling for chronic wasting disease. Um, but um, anyhow, so we've, yeah, I've trained lots of I figured it up. I probably trained about a hundred college students over the years of how to pull lymph nodes out. That's what we pulled to send to a lab to test for chronic wasting disease. So, so if you like to use a scalpel, we can learn how to use a scalpel, but anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so I would just like to, uh, we're going to wrap it up here and I, I want to thank you, David, for doing this presentation for us. It was, um, 
very interesting and informative. And uh, I want to thank everyone for spending their time with us this evening. And we hope that you enjoyed it and learned a lot. Um, if you have not visited Ivy Creek Natural Area and Historic Riverview Farm, we hope that you will soon. Also want to let you know that our next Ivy Talk will be on Wednesday, December 14th at 6.30 p.m. Dr. Carmen Harris will join us to discuss the desegregation of the Extension Service as we learn more about the role that Mr. Conley Greer played as the first African-American Extension agent in Albemarle County. And um, that is one of the individuals that lived at Riverview Farm before it became a nature preserve. Um, this talk is free and open to the public, just like this one was, uh, but we do ask that you pre-register on our website, ivycreekfoundation.org. And if you've enjoyed this talk and would like to support what we do for the community, please consider going to our website and becoming a donor today. And again, thank you all for joining us. It's been nice to have you. Have a good evening. Thank you.